you very much, everybody. Uh, we will continue with our fourth in this uh, exciting series of Inside the Surgeon's OR. Again, based on the um, Inside the Actors Studio show by James Lettman. And it is really my sincere honor to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Miguel Mercado, who uh, I think is uh, um, well known to many of us, but I think, uh, again, is a, one of the best kept secrets in HPV surgery. Uh, I got the opportunity to know Dr. Mercado and his wife uh, when we invited them to Canada. Uh, he came to Quebec City, and I learned that you always ask Dr. Mercado to speak last uh, in a symposium, because whatever uh, experience uh, that someone is talking about in that symposium, his experience uh, will be 10 times what that other person's was, and it's always better if he speaks last. He's extremely uh, humble, uh, extremely well-spoken, and extremely thoughtful surgeon. And so, again, it's, it's actually my honor uh, to, to speak with him today. And so, um, again, just as with all these uh, sessions, it's meant to be interactive. If uh, people have questions, uh, we're certainly uh, open to that. So, again, I thank you, Dr. Mercado. So, Dr. Mercado, you and I, we got to know each other a little bit. We've conversed over the last couple of months, and I was always interested in, you know, in this series of how people got to where they are today. And you, you and I have spoken a little bit about what led you to uh, become interested in surgery, and you talked about the importance of mentorship. Can you t tell us a little bit again about some of the people who are important in your life in terms of uh, getting you interested in surgery and, um, and how those uh, experiences shaped your eventual sort of career in, in, uh, in hepatobiliary surgery? Yes. Well, uh, I was interested in surgery since I was uh, 10 years old. I used to operate on every doll that my cousins had. Every doll had an incision in the belly, and such an incision, and they were very angry because I did an incision in the, in the belly of the dolls. And also I operated many, many lizards. I, I had a slingshot. I think that I killed many lizards. <laughs> and after they were dead, I began to operate on them. So I wanted to be a surgeon. Uh, and I realized that I had to study medicine to be a surgeon. And then uh, I went to the very nice university, small university in Mexico, public university, and I knew there were two surgeons, Dr. Carlos Nava from Mayo Clinic and Alberto Alcocer, uh, and they were the type of model of surgeon that I, I liked very much. And then I went, I heard uh, a lot of academic surgeons speaking in our school, uh, in between them, Dr. Campuzano, and mainly Dr. Hector Orozco. Dr. Hector Orozco, who was a figure, the best academic surgeon in our country, and I made a very nice friendship with him, and I wanted to be like him. I, I saw he had, was some type of different surgeons between the others, and that's why I began to, to uh, copy the model of an academic surgeon. That's difficult in a country like Mexico. To be only an academic surgeon uh, is not a very difficult in our hospital, but in many hospitals of, in small cities in the country, it's difficult to be an academic surgeon. So I started to copy this role. That's why I came to the, our hospital, and then I began my career there, mainly focused to an academic role. And for many of us who may not be as familiar with the Mexican medical system, what was it about those smaller hospitals that made it difficult to be an academic surgeon? Yes, because uh, the, the difference in our country are, are between population are large. You know, they're still a poor country, and no everyone has access to first-class medicine, I would say that. And so this hospital created 70 years ago it was a, a model from um, the Brigham's Hospital in Boston. And Dr. Subiran, the founder, wanted to do a hospital that uh, could do, small hospital that could do um, good medicine. For he, he he's always spoke about good medicine, not 
academic Nobel Prize student, he spoke about good medicine. And the problem from the country, for example, um, all the technologies, all the things arrived lately because of the money situation. Right. So, but that's why uh, small cities are less favorable to do uh, academic surgery. But there are wonderful cities. I will not say that Guadalajara and Monterrey are small cities now, and Puebla, of course. They are very large cities, and slowly they are growing and doing more academic medicine. How, would, how did your mentors influence how you mentor people now? Obviously, there are many uh, surgeons who cite you as a mentor, as an influence. How, uh, what did you learn from your mentors that you use today? The first thing I, I learned, for example, in, in my time, always the surgeon was operating in the right side. And uh, when I went to Germany, I saw that many cases you had to operate on the left side. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what I saw uh, there was uh, that the type of operations that were done, difficult operations, uh, uh, you can teach them, it's difficult to teach them. For example, the bile duct reconstruction is like a, like a puzzle, you know, the puzzles, you have to open the puzzle, even color, shape of the figure, mm -hmm. and it's more than a chess play. There you have the same injury, but a different situation, different scenario. And so it's difficult to teach them. So the, slowly you can teach them, but a, Looking to the cases, the fellows learn, and they follow always the counsels of Dr. Orozco. Hire the people that you know will do the things better than you. And that's it. That's the key of the hospital. No MBs, no thing. If I see a surgeon that works well, I invite him to work with us. You've mentioned this, and many of your trainees have mentioned this, that you put a lot of importance on the medicine side of surgery. And I think this was something that your, your early mentors imparted to you early. Can you t tell us what, you, what that means to you? In, in, internal medicine? Yeah, the internal medicine, understanding the internal medicine side of our surgical issues. It's the only hospital in Mexico where you have to do internal medicine before surgery. Hmm. And it was a condition because of the type of patients that you see there. Uh, so you cannot argue with an internist about a chromocytoma. It's diagnosed by an internist and so to operate. And that's one of our conditions. When we divide the surgery in our hospital, the condition is that everyone knows more about the organ or system than the internist. And mm -hmm. I'm sure that happens. All of my surgeons, I'm sure that Carlos Chan knows more than, from pancreas than the gastroenterologist. And, that's the way we can argue, we, we can win cases, it's not a matter of winning, but we convince because every surgeon knows. So I think in our hospital, it's a must to do internal medicine. Interesting, eh? because I think now in our training programs, there's so little time in our training program for non-surgical training. Do you still think that that should be an important part of surgical training everywhere? Well, I, I, we have discussed this. We, we do our residents one year more than the average in Mexico. But uh, I wanted also that they do research. And we ask always to have a couple of months to do research, but we decide to better put them in internal medicine. I think that it's better for them to be in internal medicine. But I really want to have one more year so that they can do research. And it's difficult to build basic research in the hospital, but clinical research is very open to, to You mentioned your uh, time in Germany, because you were able to go from Mexico to Germany to study. And I think my impression is you were in Germany at a very exciting time for surgery. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience, your initial impressions, what was going on in Germany at that time? Yeah, there was a hearing from Bijan Nagin when they asked which one was the very best skilled and technical surgeon. I had two teachers there, really, really extraordinary. One was Rudolf Pichelmeyer, mm -hmm. the 
very well educated, the gentleman in the operating room. He did everything easy. And Ringe, Buka Ringe was the other one. And a small one, uh, Professor Broch, that recently died. He was a, an extraordinary man, skilled, intelligent. Was, the, was these three guys, I saw him, them operating. And at that time, a big thing happened in Germany. Uh, I saw in Dusseldorf, we went to a congress, I presented 100 Mesa of Cable Shunts, and in the same panel, there was Martin Rosley uh, speaking about tips, mm -hmm. and it was Eric Mue speaking about removing gallbladders through the scope. I remember I wrote Dr. Orozco, and I told me, Dr. Orozco, I told him, I saw removing the gallbladder through a scope, and then I saw someone that puts stand between the portal vein and the suprapartic vein. He asked me only with another, what, are, what kind of scotch are you drinking? <laughs> and then I told him, that's it, really, it's going to happen. And then I saw many things. And one of the very good things that I saw is, is how the program, the liver transplant program in Germany works. So I saw that Sean surgery was, which was my main interest, was going down. There were some people doing sclerotherapy and placing bands for variceal bleeding, the tips and liver transplant. So this has been really shown, uh, was falling down and that was a pity because I went to Germany to, 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 to learn about the shots and uh, then began to... Nevertheless, we still, 10 years, we did a lot of shots operation in our hospital. But you saw the, I guess you saw the end of an era of, of a surgery and the beginning of a new one. So, um, and how, what, do you, what did you learn or what do you think we should know about shunt surgery that do you think the, moder the modern trainees have, have forgotten or don't get exposed to? Well, you know, they, uh, in, in Egypt and Brazil, still they do shunts because of schistosomiasis. Mm. But in this type of countries, there are not more shunt surgery. I had the opportunity when I became a member of the European Surgical Association to give a talk and concluding that shunts disappear because they fail to win prospective control randomized trials. Actually, the only one randomized trial that from comparing sclerotherapy, pharmacotherapy, and shunt surgery was in our hospital. We show same survival uh, with less of the bleeding. But uh, I think the, then we wrote a paper who said, Claude Organ invited us, uh, the rise, splendor, and fall of a surgical empire, and he moved splendor. Rise and fall of a surgical empire. <laughs> and then, uh, but Sean surgery, I, I am sure, still has a place. The patients that they're not good liver function, portal hypertension, no candidates for liver transplants, uh, TIPS is not the solution, failure to bands, ligation. I think they are good. And all the people that do now pancreas surgery, that do now liver transplants, I'm sure, and with all the devices that we have, uh, the operating time will be very short. Mm. In that time, we used to do a shot in six hours. I do one or two in a year now, and really I can do them with the new devices in two hours. It's a, that, so that happens to, to Sean surgery, but I found Bill Meyers yesterday, one of the last survivors of Sean surgery, and the people is not prepared now to do, to do Sean's. There is a, a, some type of operation that you have to see many times so yeah. that you can get an expert in this type of operation. You uh, mentioned in Germany you saw your, um, you first were exposed to laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Yes. And tell me what that first, op seeing, you obviously saw that operation being performed. What was that like? Walk, tell us what you felt that day in seeing that first operation. Yes, when I saw it, it was in 86, 87, 86, in, uh, and then recently released the operation. And, they were looking, because they were developing the instruments, mainly the clip prior. But what I saw, uh, I saw injuries. And I wrote to Orozco, 
it will arrive to Mexico, and please me, let me repair them. What are you talking about? It, this type of operation has, at least at the beginning, more injuries. And that's why, but that was a fever, you know, to do everything laparoscopic in Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, Germany, is, I, I think, is a country with a lot of technical developments. You know, when, when you see, I was always asking my teachers there, you see, we build Mercedes, we will build BMW, we build uh, Porsches, we do things well. <laughs> They told me, oh, we do things well. When you returned to Mexico, did you, you brought that procedure back with you? Did you teach it no, much? No? No. Actually, the very first cholestectomy was not done in our first year. The first was done in 91. Mm -hmm. I had to wait for two years for injuries. No, that's not true, but I had to wait. Uh, to, uh, the first cholestectomy was in 91. What I brought from Germany to Dr. Orozco was telling him the most to cycle that I know. When a surgeon does an operation, everything happens well. Uh, less complications, less hospital stay, uh, you can teach it better, you can investigate it better. Uh, everything works when one group does one operation. That's what I brought from Germany. Mm. I was telling Dr. Orozco at that time, uh, uh, Carlos Fernandez at that time was moving to Boston. Uh, as, uh, as a research fellow, and uh, he was also very interested in not only in pancreas surgery but also in parathyroid surgery. Yes. And I was telling him there is a guy in Germany that fixes every hyperparathyroidism. He was, and he knows more hyperparathyroidism about than the endocrinologist. And that's what I brought from Germany. Mm. Then slowly came the laparoscope, and actually I not, did not become a farmer of laparoscope. I, 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 I like it, but I, I am not a fan of laparoscopy. So we've often talked about how laparoscopic cholecystectomy was introduced, and you mentioned the uh, initial negative consequences, and that was the injury. When you look back at how we introduced that technique, do you have any specific thoughts on how new operations should be introduced? Yes, I, I, I think uh, this uh, pressure of the industry and uh, see one, do one, and teach one. And uh, I want to say, well, 25 years ago, they saw it from pig to woman in one day mm -hmm. uh, that you learn to remove the gold. I think uh, uh, everyone should have um, a, a more some type of, of training of this unusual way of operating. Nowadays, we see it easy, but at that time, I, I think that uh, uh, conversion is one of the nice things. I still, I am defend the open cholestectomy in Boston in the uh, uh, expert panel for bioduct injury, I told them to, to do open cholestectomies, and they told me, uh, you see better with the laparoscope. I told no, no, in the open, the hand is that, the one that operates. You operate with your hand. And if you can put your hand inside. And so I think that was very fast mm -hmm. the way the, the, to, to teach laparoscopic cholestectomy. And I think that that was the situation because in the 90s were so many injuries. Because everyone wanted to do, even the endoscopists wanted to do uh, cholestectomies via laparoscopy. You have amassed probably the world's largest experience in repair of bile duct injuries. What was it about you or your environment or your hospital that allowed you to become the go-to person or amass such an incredible experience? It's difficult to answer, but um, our hospital, for example, was a reference center for porta hypertension surgery. And I wanted to do that with bile duct injury because I thought it's going to happen and they're going to arrive, the, the, the injuries. And then uh, I began to speak about that. And the very early uh, development of laparoscopic cholestectomy, I began to speak about. And we had a lot of experience with glad skin tumors mm. in, in Germany. In the, in the, uh, 
In Hanover, there were an extraordinary center for biliary surgery. So uh, I was able, I told Dr. Orozco, the way to repair them is very similar to remove a class skin tumor. And, um, and then uh, one of the things that uh, I want to, I'm sure I want to, to know that in heaven, but why, uh, very nice, I know this uh, operation contra natura, to put a jejunum in that bile duct is not a good operation, but it's the only one that you can do. But uh, it bothers me that in some instances you do an extraordinary technical well operation and one year after it's closed. Mm -hmm. And that's a thing that uh, I want to always to, to ask, you know, what, what this happens. You know, it's a very nice way to help people. Mm -hmm. a young woman, healthy, with an injury, a severe injury, as Steve said yesterday, and then, a, and you can fix them and return them to normal life, but still living with the idea of having cholangitis, with the idea of uh, having strictures, is not very well, well done. But I, uh, I think that is not the best operation, and I began to, to, to do research about that, mm -hmm. clinical follow-up, and then from the country, all of the country began to, to send me the, the, the bile duct injuries, and that's why we developed the center. I have very nice fellows that have learned to repair them, and many other hospitals in our country. I don't know how many injuries we produce in a year, but it was here in Steve, he, he speaks about 400 in a year. I don't know how many we do, we have in a year, but several hospitals do them now. Right. If you were to speak to a surgeon, a young surgeon perhaps, and give him Dr. Mercado's three most important tips for repairing a bile duct injury, what would those three things be? To deal with an injury? Yes. Well, uh, if you have to ask for help in a laparoscopic cholestectomy, if you can ask for help for a repair, it's very nice. Mm -hmm. So that don't do further if you do not can do that. Don't uh, make more, uh, a more severe injury trying to repair them. Second, uh, I will say to the best way you can. If you can do it laparoscopically, do it laparoscopically. You put the robot, but if you in your conscience says, I wrote in the editorial for the Annals of Surgery, telling that the robotic repair is a minor issue or laparoscopic. The patient wants to be well. So think what you can offer to the patient. What, what things can, can you offer to the patient? And, and the other thing that I will say, if, if you see a difficult case, I have surgeons that they, they tell me, please assist me in one. To do only one, it's an operation that a regular surgeon is exposed twice in his life. So better, or you go to a center where you concentrate the cases or, or refer the case. In your publications, in your writings, you've talked a lot about uh, resection of segment four in the repair of bile duct injuries, which I think was something that I was uh, ex less exposed to. Can you tell us, just walk us through the, the, the rationale for that and why, you, why it's something that you've uh, felt is very useful? I, I, I always, one of my good teachers, Dr. Munoz Kapelman, he told me, just put an right angle there, and from when you see bile, you put the, 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 the jejunum there. And in some instances, the segment four was so, so big that you, you couldn't, you cannot see. Actually, removing segment four is only a way of lowering the plate. Mm. And is the consequence of the classical resection. I saw it when to find healthy ducts in classical resection, you have to remove segment four and five, and that's why I began to remove this. It's a very easy, it's not a new operation, it's very easy. It's a, a maneuver to lower the plate and to find healthy um, bile ducts. And 
there is more room to place the loop. Okay. What is your ideal day? What is the best day for you at work? What does a best day look like? Um, as a chairman, of, uh, I am supposed not to operate. Mm. I have now three, well, we are four in HPV now, and uh, Carlos Chan, who is the big boss in pancreas, Mario Villatobar, the big boss in transplants, or Alan Contreras, and also Ismael Dominguez, who is a very nice researcher. And I am now giving them the opportunity to do bio repairs. But they are, I don't like the administration of the hospital. <laughs> I don't understand it. So everything that they have to sign has to have the signature from everyone from the hospital. And they come the administrative explain to me, and I look them like in the film, hearing, I do not hear, yep. and they explain. So I don't want to do administrative <laughs> I do not uh, like complaints. Right. Mainly, I do not like disruptive surgery. I don't like the people that get angry in the operating room. And, and, and each time that one nurse comes to me and says, this surgeon went mad in the operation, that, that, that I do not like. The, the best thing that I can do is to operate, and then um, I begin to, to think about future papers. Okay. And I will tell you something. I begin on the contrary writing first the discussion, ah. and then, that's not good, but, and then I ask the people to, to, to look for this data, and then, uh, if that does not shape with the discussion, I change it. But after doing so many cases, I think that, oh, and that's the ideal day, the, to go to the operating room. In the operating room, I really um, do, um, I go away, with my thoughts. Um, recently, I had a very small coronary accident. Oh, dear. And then I started to slow down a little, but, but now I still am returning to operate. What's your ideal or best day away from the hospital or away from work? What does that day look like? Mm, being with my wife. Yeah, <laughs> good answer. Good answer. I answer carefully, your wife is very much. close. And I like also to go to with fellows and friends to they invite me to nice restaurants to have a good meat and some scotch. So oh, very good. What are you most proud of in your career? Well, in, I think that's for our hospital, not for me, but being elected for the American Surgical being elected for the European Surgical and uh, receiving the national prize of research from the president of the country. And now the distinguished award that I'm going to receive, it is, it's very, very nice for me. But it's not for me. I think it's for the hospital. And what are you most proud of personally? Most for, for my family. Excellent. What can, what should the world learn from Mexican surgeons? What can the world learn from Mexico? I think the, we can learn from every country that you see. The, I think that the surgeons do a very nice job with limitations in small and large countries. I think that uh, Mexico is a large country and uh, we have very good surgeons in very well-trained surgeons. Most of them train outside. Most of them train in the United States. Mm -hmm. And I really like that uh, many of our residents stay in the United States. And that's a pity because the country cannot offer or give them what they want. And that makes me a little, a, a little bit sad not to give the opportunity in Mexico. But I think that uh, you can learn many things in the country, the type of medicine that we do with special things, for example, uh, maybe liver abscess, that, that it's not, we don't see it in the hospital, but it's some type of pathology that we still see in Mexico. 
Are there any questions from the audience that they would like to ask Professor Mercado? Well, I, it's been a sincere honor for me, sir, to sit here with you and to, uh, to get to know you better. I think on behalf of the audience and, uh, and the HPBA, we're extremely grateful that you've taken this time to share with us. And uh, again, thank you for sharing your expertise with us and the world. Thank you. It's an honor to be with you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Roger. Oh, fantastic.